before we begin, just let me dispense with let me just dispense with the, the formalities. I have you registered as Allison Mitchell, representing the Anderson County Criminal District Attorney's Office, testifying neutral on the topic. Yes, yes sir. Okay, great. Thank you, and I thank you. First of all, I want to, as a former prosecutor, certainly want to thank you for the service you provide to your community, um, and thank you for taking the time uh, to be with us today. Uh, I certainly know that uh, uh, you're, there are many demands on your schedule, um, and so thank you for, for taking the time to, to be with us. Uh, we're grateful, grateful to have you with us today. Thank you, and thank you so much for allowing me to appear by Zoom. No, I'm, and look, it's a, it's a, it's certainly, um, certainly a courtesy one to extend. I know that there's a lot going on, and um, both personally and professionally, and so we're definitely um, happy to extend that courtesy. Thank we're, you. We're, we're just grateful that you were able to take the time with us. Um, I do know that. Um, so what I want to, uh, well, I'll start with, and I want to let you offer uh, testimony. As you know, the topic that we posted obviously implicates. Um, uh, Robert Robertson's case, um, but we are also discussing generally Article 11073, Code of Criminal Procedure, um, its applicability, um, how it's utilized, and so um, certainly want to hear your thoughts on, on that as well, how you've seen it as a prosecutor, uh, how you interact with it, what that looks like procedurally. I think that's important for us to know, um, and so um, want to want to give want to give you uh, give you the floor. I know the members will have questions once you're done. Um, and we'll give you every opportunity to, uh, to to flesh out any other things that you'd like to talk about. Yes, sir. All right, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Before I begin, I wanted to inform the committee that I have a hard stop at five o'clock. My niece is having her first communion. And I was one of the six people she selected to attend. Well, congratulations. That's a really Thank important you. I'm very moment. Proud of her. Very important moment in a young person's life. Thank you. All right. Well, so we, we will be as, efficient with our time. Yes, sir. Um, as the chairman said, my name is Allison Mitchell. I'm the current criminal district attorney for Anderson County. I was elected on January 1st of 2015. Mr. Roberson's case was decided over 20 years ago. I was an assistant DA in this office, but I only handled misdemeanor cases. So I did not have any participatory role in Mr. Robertson's original case. However, since being elected in, I believe it was 2016, um, the Court of Criminal Appeals sent the case down based off of Article 11.073. And we had a hearing that was during COVID's time, so it got delayed. But I believe in 2022, we were actually able to have a hearing on the very things that have been discussed today. Um, that went on for two weeks. Uh, the state had experts. Mr. Roberson had experts. The trial judge made her findings, facts, and conclusions of law, sent it up to the Court of Criminal Appeals, and they had it for some time and conducted an independent review and believed that their, the relief under 11.073 should be denied. That's my first experience dealing with this particular article, um, the article 11.073. Oh, this, this, so this, in this case, this is the, this is the sole interaction with, with that particular provision. Correct. And when you and when you said that they, I'm trying to remember the word you used there, that they, the court of criminal appeals after the findings of fact and conclusions of law were sent up by the habeas court, um, the district court there, that the, that there was uh, there was a subsequent hearing at the court of criminal appeals or what was the what was the analysis done there? The, the analysis was done at the court of criminal appeals without testimony. They had the transcripts from the um, Article 11 hearing itself. The, okay, the, the subsequent hearings that you just described? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, well, so I'll, so I'll, ask, I'll ask this question just procedurally on 11073. I know this, this is the sole experience uh, in dealing with that statute that we've had for about 10 years. Um, in, in your experience in this case, um, uh, how did it function? 
what were the procedural uh, mechanisms that you, you saw? Because once that was filed, you have been kind of a lead prosecutor on this case? Yes, sir. Okay. So if you want just to kind of give us an overview of procedurally what that looked like from your office, how that, you know, how that proceeded and, 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 uh, and the interplay between uh, counsel uh, for the defense, your office, and then with the Court of Criminal Appeals. Yes, sir. So uh, once it got sent back, we had a hearing within the parameters of 11.073. The Court of uh, Criminal Appeals had, I believe it was four different items that we had to address. We had um, experts come, including the original medical examiner. We also had Dr. James Downs, who's recognized throughout the United States as an expert in multiple fields. Mr. Roberson was able to bring many witnesses to show alternate theories of how Nikki died, including Dr. Auer that you just heard from. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as our experience with this particular article, we believe that um, we're thankful for the article because it adds another checks and balances. We're also grateful that it can be appealed up to the Court of Criminal Appeals as another um, safety net to make sure everything was done correctly. And we believe, based on the evidence, the fact that prior hearings, the original trial, that um, the Court of Appeals, took, Court of Criminal Appeals, took this seriously and made a decision. Okay. All right. No, I appreciate that. Um, so you've about when when in time you said you were elected in 2016. No, sir. I took. Uh, office on January 1st of 2015. Oh, okay. Sorry. I, yes, sir. I, I misheard. Um, That's okay. And uh, is it fair to say that um, you are very familiar with the trial record and with the habeas record that was taken at the district court? Yes. Yes, sir. In order to be fully prepared for everything, myself and my first assistant, Scott Holden, read the original trial transcripts. We read all the appellate um, briefs that we could find because due to the age of the case, there were some that we couldn't see. And um, obviously, we read the transcript of the Article 11 hearing. Okay. All right. So, fair to say that you, yeah, you, this, uh, your knowledge of this case is, is pretty in depth at this point. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. No, yeah. Um, <laughs> I know. I'm yeah, an honor. <laughs> I know. My, my, uh, my dad's a judge, so I got to make sure I don't get confused with him. Um, so I just want to kind of flesh out. Now we've heard some, some, we heard some of the testimony, some of the stuff that you've heard, uh, before too. And I just want to kind of get your perspective on some of the issues that are floating around out there for us to be able to kind of evaluate our, our legislative role. Um, particularly when it comes to, you know, science that evolves over time. Like you said, these are safety nets that we, you know, legislatures put a number of them in place. This is one of them. Um, in this particular case, is it um, is it your is it your position? I've read through some of the pleadings, but obviously not certainly not as as in depth as, as you are familiar with them. Is it is it your position that this particular case is is not a shaken baby case? Based on the evidence that was presented at the original trial, whereas Dr. Urban um, said that shaking was a component, but that Nikki died from blunt force trauma. It was agreed to by Dr. Downs in the subsequent Article 11 writ. Um, based on the totality of all the evidence that was presented as far as Mr. Roberson saying himself um, to his psychiatrist at the time, Nikki was crying, I lost it, I shook her. Yes, we believe that's a component, but that's all that it is. It's not solely a shaken baby case, which distinguishes it from Rourke. No, and I think, what, yeah, I think Rourke is an important thing uh, to discuss. What, what, um, back in, back in 03 when this trial was, was, was tried, what is your understanding of the version of shaken baby that was generally accepted at the time of the trial? My understanding is that there were some people that disagreed with the description of shaken baby, but it was something that people were in fact talking about. But I, I want to point out during the original trial that one of the doctors, I can't remember if it was Squires or Urban, um, 
corrected the then prosecutor that was trying the case that this was not just a shaken baby case. Okay. And and since since that time, and I know there's been a lot of conversation about this today. Do you think the understanding of shaken baby syndrome has changed in any way? No, sir. I believe that the concept is still there. I believe there's alternate theories to how uh, cause of death in children that are abused this way can happen. Mm -hmm. um, shaken baby, which is, of course, now called abusive head trauma, is widely recognized nationally and internationally as a viable medical diagnosis. And, and to come to that conclusion, how, um, how did you educate yourself about anything that had changed in that time frame? Um, through research online and looking at the, the past transcripts and the evidence that was presented at trial. It, is it accurate? Is it accurate to say that the uh, Mr. Robertson's uh, appointed defense lawyer uh, conceded at the time of trial that this was a shaken baby case? I think that they, I'd hate to assume what they were thinking at the time, to be honest with you, but... Does, does the record reflect that? It says that they said that, yes, sir, in the opening, I believe it is that this was a shaken baby case. Um, that was definitely discussed all throughout the trial. They also talked about she just fell off the bed and these caused her injuries. And they had other experts to testify as well. And, and so in your, in your analysis of the trial record, which, uh, which witnesses uh, testified about shaking as the cause of Nikki's condition? I'd have to refer back to the original trial transcript to be fully accurate with you. Okay. Uh, and I know earlier today we, we met with Detective Wharton, um, and he stated to us that he didn't see multiple impacts in his investigation. Is, is that your understanding? That's my understanding of what he's saying today, yes, sir. Okay, did he say something different at the trial? Yes, sir, he did. Um, we checked the transcripts and he was asked about bruising on Nikki and he admitted that there were multiple bruises on her and that the back of her head was mushy or boggy. And was that in reference to the knot on the back of her head? The bogginess would be probably from the blood force trauma. There were multiple alleged multiple blood force trauma sites. And in our review of, of Dr. Squire's uh, testimony, um, she testified that she didn't see any additional impacts besides the single small knot. Is that is that inaccurate? To be perfectly honest with you, I'd have to refer back to what her actual testimony was, and I don't have that in front of me. Okay. Is there anything you recall about her testimony to that effect? I recall her testimonies. Mainly, she talked a lot about Nikki's condition at Children's. Okay. Um, I really would, uh, truly, to be fully accurate and on, honest with the committee, I'd have to refer back. I understand that. Um, did, in your review of the case, have you reviewed the medical records of, of Nikki? Yes. Okay. Um, and in our review of, of things, and that's why, why you're here, we want to try to, we're clear about everything. Did the medical examiner admit that she did not review the child's medical records? Medical history? Again, I apologize. I have to go back and refer to the original, the, to the transcript itself. I just don't remember off the top of my head. Okay. Because there were some, there was some significant medical history in Nikki's past. As far as her being sick? Yes. Is that yes, sir. And, yes, sir. And um, do you know whether or not the medical examiner admitted that she didn't look at the records from her final hospitalizations? <clears throat> I do not do not know the answer to that question. I know that medical examiners obviously are the ones that open up the body to see what damage is done in the event of a death. But as far as the review of the medical records, I'd have to refer back to the original transcripts. Okay. Now, um, earlier we heard from 
uh, Dr. Francis Green regarding uh, his pneumonia finding. Um, have you had the opportunity to review Dr. Green's uh, pneumonia finding report? No, but I did listen to him testify. Okay. Um, do you have any reactions for the committee based on his testimony? This very issue of pneumonia was brought up in the original Article 11.073 hearing that we had back in, I believe, 22. Um, I think Dr. Auer was the one that brought up the pneumonia. Um, he similarly testified to what Mr. Green was. I believe that they actually are co-workers. Um, Dr. Downs, James Downs, testified that through his uh, Looking at the tissue in Nikki, the physiology of it all, the lack of wheezing or any other symptom when she first came in, he disagreed and said there was no pneumonia. Okay. So was so Dr. Downs is the 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 expert that you relied on to state that Nikki did not have pneumonia. That among other things, yes, sir. Okay, and is Dr. Downs a a lung expert or a lung pathologist? He is. Let me see here, and I can ask answer that question. He has a lot of titles behind his name. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, yeah, their CVs all seem to be very. Lengthy. I mean, I know that he is a. I can't find it off the top of my head, but I know he's a forensic psycho. Or wait. Yeah, let's see here. I don't want to lead you the wrong way. I just know he's an expert in three different fields. Okay. And I know as a part of his testimony that he had a colleague who's an expert in children radiology to look at everything. Okay. Do you recall the name of that expert? It was a female out of South Carolina, I believe. Okay. Um. I know when Dr. Green testified earlier, and I'm I, I'm unclear whether I don't I don't know because I know you've got a busy schedule. Have you able, been able to hear all the testimony today, or just portions of it, or portions of it? It was hard to hear some people. Yeah, no, we're dealing with um, the technology like everybody else, so we're doing our. That's best. why I keep turning my ear because we don't have very loud speakers at the county. <laughs> Yeah, one second. Sorry. What? Yes, uh, Representative just a, Harrison. Just a very quick question before we move on. The, the, the examiner that did the examination of, of the lungs, was that doctor a forensic lung specialist? Doc, the one that testified, that the one that Dr. Downs testified. Is doctor, was, do, was Dr. Downs a forensic lung specialist? I don't believe he was a forensic lung specialist specifically. Thank you. Um, we heard a, uh, some conversation today about um, medication that Nikki was prescribed in the final weeks of her life. Um, did you engage in any assessment about the medications that were prescribed to her? Those very issues were brought up in the Article 11.073 hearing. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Robertson was able to, to bring to light the fact that Nikki was prescribed the phenogren. Dr. Downs testified that in his review of the records that she did not indicate any type of phenogren toxicity. Um, but it was addressed. Okay. And what, and what do you know about Finnegan? I know that Finnegan's prescribed when you're nauseous. At least that's been the story in my life. Okay. And, and we heard testimony earlier about uh, black box warnings on, on that particular uh, prescription. Um, are you aware of those black box warnings that are now required? Yeah. Yes, sir. I know that for the um, oral route with Finnegan, it's not recommended for children under two, which of course Nikki was not under two. She was almost three years old. And now if it's, it's given in suppository form, it's not necessarily recommended for those under the age of two. Okay.
Did you find that in your evaluation, the prescription of fenugrin, you know, with and without codeine, um, was that relevant to, do you find that to be relevant to, uh, to Mr. Robertson's case in explaining? Based on the evidence that was presented at trial through the post-conviction writs and the hearing that we had, we do not believe so. Okay. And how about the temperature that she presented at um, shortly prior to this incident of 104.5? Is that something that was about that you evaluated or that that um, you think is relevant to the proceedings at all? Based off the evidence that was presented at the original trial and also in the post conviction writ, the Article 11.073. The temperature was discussed. Um, as uh, most people know, small children can spike high fevers and it mm -hmm. can go down just as fast. Um, I believe Dr. Downs and other testimony from the original trial was she did not have a fever, fever when she first presented to the hospital that day, that night okay. or morning. Yes, Representative Schatzline. Hi, just a clarifying question. Um, so you mentioned, because just curious, when we're talking about pneumonia specifically, um, you mentioned that the reason that that was dismissed was because there was not wheezing. Is that the only reason that it was dismissed? No, sir. It was only brought up in the post-conviction writ, the Article 11.073. There's a whole host of reasons why um, our expert believe that that was not a factor, including the multiple blunt force traumas that Nikki suffered from. But blunt force traumas, you, you can acknowledge that wouldn't affect whether she had or didn't have pneumonia. And I'm not acknowledging that she did have those because everything we've heard today uh, alludes to the fact that she didn't have those. So, but you, the connection with pneumonia, could you expound on why you came to the conclusion that she doesn't have pneumonia? In the Article 11.73 writ, that is what Dr. Downs testified to. He had provided to Mr. Robinson and not myself and the trial judge slides explaining why. He did mention in his testimony that due to her being vented, that she did have some pneumonia from the vent. It had a fancy word, and I can't remember what it was. Okay. Um, did you have the opportunity to review a medical, um, medical report from Dr. Keenan Bora, who's a medical toxicologist? I don't recognize that name. No. Okay. Um, who, in your evaluation and your assessment of the case, who, who was it that you or your office relied on to decide that the medications that we've talked about, that this child had been prescribed, were not relevant to the understanding of, of her death? Dr. James Downs, that testified in the Article 11 hearing. Okay. And those issues were solely contained within the habeas court hearings? They were all of the, all the things that are being continued to be, are, I'm sorry, I got tongue-tied. Mm -hmm. The pneumonia, the fenugrin, the um, natural cause of death, uh, all that had been, has been previously litigated in pursuant to Article 11. Okay, um, but didn't present itself in the trial transcript itself? I do not recall. I would have to refer back to the original trial transcript. I apologize. No, that's okay. Going back to, and I, I, I don't want to, I know that you're on a hard stop, so I don't want to monopolize the time if other members have questions. Um, you have the habeas court, because what happens in these proceedings is the Court of Criminal Appeals says, hey, we're sending this back down to the district court. Essentially, we want you to hold some hearings. We want you to do the legwork um, to evaluate these issues, right? That's kind of how it goes. And, yes, sir. And so that happened, that happened here. Once that concludes, do both parties then submit to the court? Now, uh, a, a proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law? The trial judge in any criminal case, when a case is being appealed up, um, can ask both sides to give their findings of fact and conclusions of law to the judge, and ultimately the judge decides which to adopt and which not to adopt. And then once it's appealed up to the Court of Criminal Appeals, in this case, 
then the Court of Criminal Appeals could have rejected the findings of facts and conclusions of law yes, and I said, wanna, no, we disagree. Yeah, I want to get to I want to get to that because that's some of the procedural stuff I want to make sure we all understand. Yes, sir. Um, in this case, both parties did submit their own proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law. That's correct. It's not unheard of for parties to confer with one another on those proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law, is it? Uh, if, there's I, if there are items that they might agree on? I've been a prosecutor for 20 years, and I've never experienced that before. Okay. Um, but in this case, both parties sent up their, essentially sent to the district court judge, proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law. That's correct. Okay. And the judge, the judge, um, in your estimation, did the judge, um, uh, did the judge wholly adopt the state's findings of fact and conclusions of law? I would have to have both of them in front of me to make that analysis, and I do not. Okay. Can you can you give can you shed any sort of light on how you because I mean the district judge has does have the opportunity to like you just said pick and choose was there anything in your memory about what the district judge adopted that came from defense counsel's proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law again I apologize without having them in front of me I'd be unable to make that determination okay and so then that goes from the district judge back up to the court of criminal appeals and as you said. The court can do a couple things with that. They can reject them, right? Or they can yes, essentially agree to that. And in this case, the findings of fact and conclusions of law that were sent up from the habeas court were adopted in whole or in part by the Court of Criminal Appeals? I believe in full. Okay. Sorry, I don't mean to get too much in the process, but the procedure is important to kind of how we will understand our law is being worked with at the courts. So thank, yes, you, thank you for going into that. Um, I know there's been some discussion about some medical images of Nikki that were rediscovered in 2018 that had essentially been sitting in a box for 15 years. Does that sound accurate to you? Yes, we were actually getting ready to start the hear the first hearing, and the district clerk said, wait, I think I know where those are, and she literally went and got them, and we were all very surprised. Okay, and so when you got those images, um, did you or your office consult with the radiologist to analyze those records? If I remember correctly, we were getting them developed. We could not find anyone in East Texas that could do it. And I believe that Mr. Roberson's defense was a, were able to develop it. Okay. So it, for your office's purposes, you didn't have someone to be able to evaluate uh, from a radiological standpoint? Yes, sir. As was found out in the subsequent Article 11 um, hearing that we had, that Dr. Downs had looked at them and also referred it to a colleague who specialized and pediatric radiology. Okay, and in, in some of the some of the medical images that you know are, are CAT scans. You you would agree that CAT scans are significant evidence. I think in any case, any evidence is significant. Um, do you know whether or not the medical examiner who claimed to see multiple impacts had the opportunity to review those CAT scans? No, sir, I do not know that. Okay. Um, do you know if, based on your review of medical records, whether or not Nikki had any neck injuries? I'm thinking. I'm trying to recall. I think primarily the bruising was, it looked like a handprint to her face, bruises around her head, and, of course, bruises on her actual head itself. And a scrape on an elbow, I believe. Okay. But um, neck injuries is not something that you recall? Not without reviewing it again. Uh, understood. It, yes, sir. In your review of those records, do you recall any broken bones? No, sir. You mentioned some bruising. Um, were there abrasions to her, uh, Nikki's face? Yes, your, yes, that's what I remember from uh, the transcript. And I believe, in fact, Justice, 
yearly just he pointed out this exact same bruising and his concurring and opinion on rejecting one of the reds. Yeah, I've got that here in front of me. I appreciate that. Um, in your review of those medical records, is it your understanding, what is your understanding of whether there was any external bleeding when she was brought to the hospital? I believe that the evidence showed that she had an injury to her mouth. Um, I believe a wash rag was found later with some blood in it. As far as other bleeding about her body, I would have to go back and look at the transcript again. Okay. Do you know whether or not Nikki was intubated in the hospital? I believe she was. Okay. And, and what, else, what else do you recall that you can share with us that you remember about the medical measures that were first taken at the Palestine Hospital? I believe that the evidence showed there was a delay in getting Nikki to the hospital. Once there, she was lifeless and blue and limp. That the first nurse, Kelly Gerganis, um, noticed that something was seriously wrong, as did the ER doctor, Dr. Kajoyan. Um, they both believed that Nikki had, in fact, been abused by all the injuries that they noted as far as her being unconscious, not breathing, the boggy brain or <laughs> boggy back of her head. And I believe that superiors had to come in to also make the determination before CPS was called. Okay. What is your recollection uh, about the medical measures that were taken at, at Dallas Children's Hospital? I'd have to really refer back to the record. Um, I know that Nikki was placed on life support while she was there. Okay. Are, are you are you aware, and we, we've heard some testimony about it today, are you aware of the evidence that, that Nikki had a clotting disorder? <clears throat> I do not remember reading that or seeing that in any of the prior hearings or trans or uh, original jury trial. I'd have to refer back to see. Okay, so you, that's not something that you recall hearing? No, sir, I do not recall that. Okay. Um, do you know whether or not the medical examiner had any knowledge about a clotting disorder? I do not have independent knowledge of that. Okay. Let me add. Did you have questions, Jeff? Or Brian? No, I, sorry, I, don't, I'm, I feel like I'm monopolizing time, and I know that, the, I know that you have a hard stop. But um, I do. Yeah, Representative Leach, if you have some questions. Is, is, it, is it your recollection that, that Nikki was, in fact, I think you just stated she was placed on life support when she arrived at the hospital? Yes. I don't know her condition before she got to Children's, but I do know that she was placed on life at support at some point. Um, do, you know how, do, you know how long, do you know how long no. she was on life support for? I do not know. I'd have to refer back to the records. I apologize. Do you know who gave uh, permission for her to be removed from life support? I do not know the answer to that question. I'd have to refer back to the transcripts. Do you know if Mr. Do you know if Mr. Robertson gave his permission or approval for her to be removed from life support? I do not know that. I'd have to refer to the transcripts. When were you, um, uh, Ms. Mitchell, notified of and requested to be a part of this committee hearing today? Yesterday, I believe. We were closed on Monday, so if it was Monday, I wouldn't have gotten it until yesterday. Well, I, I, and I'll clarify that. I know it was sent. It it was sent over. It sent over the weekend. So I do under, I do understand that um, it was sent. It was sent. Uh, I can find it. But. And, and you were you requested the uh, you you moved for the execution to be date uh, execution date to be set. When was that? Remind me of that date. I'm not 100% sure without checking back, but it was sometime this year, maybe this summer. I, I, I think you're right. I think it was this summer. And I would, I would, I would expect, with all due respect, Ms. Mitchell, um, and, I, and I mean that sincerely, with all due respect for you and your, your position as the elected district attorney for Anderson County, I would expect for you to have more uh, personal knowledge of the trial record and of these facts, very basic facts, I might add, that, that we're asking you today, I would, have, I would have definitely expected you to have those in advance of requesting an execution date to be set. 
um, and, and certainly would have expected you to have that information in advance of this committee hearing. How much time do you feel like um, you would need to uh, review and prepare before a if, if this committee hearing wanted if this committee wanted to hold a subsequent committee hearing on this case, how much time do you feel like you would need to review the trial record so that you could actually provide us answers to these questions? I would have to check my schedule. My trial schedule, we have four district judges that are here every week. We try cases every single week. Um, I would also have to see how long it would take me to reread those. I encourage the committee to definitely take a look at all the transcripts in this case. Well, we, we have uh, and are actively uh, doing that. The purpose of this committee hearing is to, uh, to, is to shine a light on what happened in that courtroom and in your court in your county, um, and, and, and we're taking our job very seriously, and I would, have, I would have expected, again, with all due respect, for you to have um, answers to our questions, and, and you've been able to answer some of them, but, but largely you've just referred us back to our trial record when, when we're asking, asking you to answer that for us and for the people of Texas who we represent. And so if you could get back with us because um, I think it's going to be incumbent upon this committee to sooner than later hold another hearing and request you and invite you back so that we can get answers to these questions um, that I would have expected you to have answers to today. So if you could let us know how much time you think you'll need um, and, and how it will work with your schedule, uh, Ms. Mitchell, I would certainly appreciate that. Thank you for your comments. And I will absolutely get with uh, Ms. Westfall when I will be able to do that. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. I just um, going back to the CAT scans. You said that Dr. Downs had had some part in weighing in on on the the CAT scans that were discovered. That's correct. In the Article Eleven Point Zero Seven Three hearing that we had. And. And is it, was it Dr. Downs' testimony that the CAT scans portrayed multiple impacts? Actually, he used the autopsy photos mainly for that. He had provided a slideshow, just like many of the defense witnesses had. And he was able to pinpoint and show to the court and the people in the courtroom exactly where the multiple blood force trauma impacts occurred. Are CAT scans not instructive? of confirming or denying an assertion like that? That's not what I'm saying respectfully, sir. What I'm saying is that when he was explaining the thing, he actually used the actual autopsy photos so we could visually see it with the naked eye. He also used autopsy photos of the brain. Um, I, I know that he looked at the CAT scans. I'd have to refer back to see exactly what he said about them. Okay. Uh, Representative Harrison. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, District Attorney, for joining us here today. Um, I, I jot down a lot, a lot of notes. I want to ask you a couple of clarifying questions about them. You said um, when you were, or were asked, or I can't remember if you were, at, if it was responsive to a question or part of your, your prepared testimony, that um, shaken baby syndrome was, quote, just a component of the state's case. What was That's the what was the remainder? What, what was the remainder of the state's case? As was testified in trial, Shaky was a component. It was confirmed by Mr. Roberson himself when he's made the statements to his psychiatrist. The other component was the blunt force trauma injuries that Nikki suffered all over her head internally. Um, if you were to quantify how much of the state's case was predicated upon a shaken baby hypothesis versus what I'm hearing right now, which it, it appears to me you're asserting a battery case. How would, how would you quantify the percent of the case was predicated on each? I believe that would be very difficult to do, considering the evidence showed that it was both factors, with the ultimate factor of Nikki's death being caused by the blunt force trauma. Um, have you spoken to Dr. Squires, who I believe made um, the original diagnosis and, and testified at the trial about it? Have you spoken directly to that doctor? I've not spoken directly with her, but someone in my office has. 
do you know if that person has spoken with her now? Uh, well, and as to whether she believes that um, the implications of the shaken baby um, syndrome hypothesis have evolved in the um, two decades since this was at trial? In initial conversations with her in preparation for the Article 11 hearing, she stood by her original diagnosis um, that Nikki was sh shaken, but also I believe, and I'd have to double check, that she in fact also recognized the blood force injuries that Dr. Urban had found. What was shaken or was shaken sufficient to kill a child? That was not the case in this particular one. There were double components of shaking and of blood force trauma to the head. Okay. What do you make of what appears to be, even amongst people who still support the concept of shaken baby syndrome and, and even defend its application in criminal cases, um, what is your personal opinion of the paradigm shift between what was the case in 2003, where if the triad was present, it could be presumed to be of use, whereas a uh, what my understanding is and what has been testified ad nauseum today is that it is only a, uh, a diagnosis or a theory that is applicable in a criminal case once all other alternative theories have been excluded. What is your, um, what is your analysis of that shift in the medical community's view of SBS? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Absolutely. Thank you. The, medical com the prevailing wisdom amongst the medical community, to the best of my understanding, as has been uh, testified today, is that in 2002 or 2003, if the triad of symptoms were present, abuse was to be presumed. That does not appear to be the case anymore, at least according to every single expert witness today. And in fact, the, even the adherence to SBS, the people that still believe that SBS is an appropriate uh, theory and that it is still uh, appropriate to apply it in criminal courts, they only think that is to be the, uh, the case after all alternative theories have been excluded. What is your analysis of that, of that paradigm shift amongst the medical community in the, in, in, the, uh, in the previous 20 years? Thank you for clarifying Absolutely. for me. As I said earlier, shaken baby, which is now called abusive head trauma, is widely recognized as a medical diagnosis among pediatricians nationally and internationally. In our particular case with Mr. Roberson, in addition to her eyes hemorrhaging and the subdura and the things in her brain, um, she had more because of the blunt force trauma. That's I, the difference. Not to be disruptive, but you, you have a hard stop and I want to respect that. Um, what other alternative explanations were discussed at trial in front of the jury that could have caused those triad of symptoms? As I said before, I was not DA at the time, so I was not present. But from your, the trial. from your review, from your, yes, sir. from your, from your review of the trial and of the medical evidence, what else was was ideated upon in front of the jury that could have alt could have explained those those triad of symptoms? And yes, by the sir, way, out of respect, uh, attorney, I, I understand you weren't there. I know you didn't argue the case. You did request the execution date to be set. So I do, I do think it is fair that this committee has some base level expectation of your knowledge of the case. There was, t thank you so much for that. Absolutely. There was testimony that was given by Dr. Squires and Dr. Urban at trial to talk about the blunt force trauma. The defense put on evidence that Nikki had fallen out of the bed as Mr. Roberson in one of the versions of the story that he said happened that night. Um, they did present that to the jury. Are you aware, did you hear the testimony this morning from the lead detective in the case when and he was asked about his um, recollections of the uh, shaken baby syndrome and the percentage of the state's case that it took up and he said it was, quote, the entirety of the case. Are you aware of that testimony from this morning? No, I'm not. Okay. Um, did the jury in the trial case, again, I'm aware you didn't argue the case, did the jury ever hear any arguments from the defense of actual evidence of the defendant? Evidence meaning? Evidence that he did not in fact commit a crime. 
I believe that was elicited through cross-examination. Okay. Out of respect for your time, I'm going I'm to move on. Um, has any jury at any time heard any evidence or arguments of the following things? That there was a CAT scan, which I wish we had more time. I would really love the state's explanation for how this, this evidence, this medical evidence, was somehow missing and disappeared for 15 years locked in the basement of your courthouse. I, I would love to spend time on that, but we, we don't have time for that. Has any jury heard any evidence or arguments regarding a CAT scan, which does appear, according to expert testimony, to show only one single minor impact site to the head? Was any jury ever made aware of this? I want to clarify, first of all, if I may, um, once, as the committee should know, that once evidence is submitted in a criminal trial, it becomes property of the court and the clerk is the caretaker of that. It's not something that the state was in possession of as it was entered into evidence. So there was nothing nefarious there by the state or by the defense. I would appreciate have to the back clarification, but the reason this line of questioning is, is critically important because the le legislature has a question before our committee right now as to whether our, our extant junk science law is being faithfully adhered to. Because there may be medical evidence that is materially relevant to the outcome of this case that has or has not been heard before any jury. So I would just appreciate a response. Has any jury at any point in time ever heard expert testimony on the, scan, the CAT scan that showed there was only one single minor abrasion or um, bump on the back of the head? I would have to refer back to the trial transcript so you don't to see know. if the fact. You don't know. I would have to refer okay. back to Thank the you. trial has any transcript. Jury, has any jury heard any evidence or arguments to show that um, a shortfalls from beds can, in fact, um, be significant? I believe that was brought up in the original case. Okay, you think that one was heard. Okay, has any jury heard arguments or evidence that CAT scans and autopsy photos show only a single impact site on Nikki's head and only a small amount of subdural blood and brain swelling at that part? Has any jury heard arguments or evidence to that effect? I would have to check the original so transcript to accurately know. testify. Has any jury heard any today? arguments or evidence to the effect that Nikki had potentially toxic quantities of a drug, Finnegan? in her bloodstream at the time of autopsy? And has any jury grappled with or interacted with the facts that those drugs now carry an FDA black box warning against prescribing it to children's, yes, Nikki's age. The black box warning from the FDA is directly applicable to children that, that were the age of Nikki at the time. Has any jury ever interacted with or heard arguments to that effect? Respectfully, sir, that was brought up during the Article 11.07 hearing, jury, so I'm that's the problem. ...of a judge, not in front of a jury, so it was not known at the time. ...or in her system at the time. I would have to check the original trial see, transcript see that was in front of a jury. I, I have several more questions along the, the lines of this, but I, I don't see the value in them, and we're running up on time. Um, you mentioned in your testimony a minute ago that Nikki's body was lifeless, blue, and limp. As a father of four young kids, this is heartbreaking to hear of any child. Are you aware of the um, episodes that are documented according to witness testimony in her medical history of previous episodes of breathing apnea where she also presented at the hospital with those exact same symptoms? The maternal grandmother testified to that in the original trial, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. when she was younger. So, so you are aware that at previous times in Nikki's young life, she had presented to the hospital lifeless, blue, and limp? According to the evidence presented at the original trial, yes. Do you believe those were the result of abuse? What was the result of abuse? Her presenting at the hospital lifeless, blue, and limp from previous episodes with breathing apnea. I'm not in a position to speculate as to that. But you wouldn't dispute that she had showed up to the hospital with similar presentations in the past and that there was never a finding or adjudication or allegations of abuse, is that correct? I believe that her presenting with sleep apnea would appear different, but I would have to go back and look at the evidence that was presented at trial. It was, yeah, it was not sleep apnea, breathing apnea. I apologize, I misspoke. That's a significant difference. Okay, I'll wrap up. Um, you set the execution date. You don't, you don't know when. Do you know why? Because that was the next step in the course of the law. 
Were you satisfied that a, that a murder had been committed? Yes. What was that based on? The totality of the evidence at the original trial, post writs that have been filed in hearings that have been held. Just to be clear, you're referencing evidence that uh, no less than 30 times in this hearing you have said that you, you have no knowledge of at the moment. Is that correct? I'm sorry, sir. What was the question? Just I'll move on. Um, the justice system can get things wrong. Is that correct? That's possible? Just like any humans, police officer, priest, yes, that's possible. Is there any chance in your mind whatsoever that a murder did not take place in this case? Based on the totality of the evidence, as I've stated, a murder took place here. Mr. Roberson took the life of his almost three-year-old daughter. And you have 100% certainty that that happened. I'm not, asking what, I'm not asking what the legal standard is in court. What was the question? I'm not asking what the legal standard is in court. I am asking how certain you are, having reviewed the evidence, which you must have reviewed, because you requested an execution date. What is your, as a percentage, what is your certainty that a murder occurred in this case? I trust in the legal process that it has the safety nets and reviews to do the checks and balances to make sure everything is right, and I believe that that did occur here. So to be clear, you trust in a process that one moment ago you admit sometimes does fail. Thank you very much for your testimony. Well, that's why we have the checks and balances of the upper courts um, to make sure that things are done right. Thank you, Representative. Um, Ms. Mitchell, and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you, I know you've got a hard stop, so I'm going to let you go quickly. No, no, all good. Um, did you, what's your opinion on whether any of the evidence that was submitted by defense counsel during the habeas hearings um, is your opinion that um, none of it contradicted the scientific evidence that was relied upon in the trial of Mr. Robertson? I believe that the evidence that was presented by Mr. Robertson provided alternate theories as to Nikki's death without considering the blunt force trauma. Did you find any of the evidence that was provided during the habeas hearings as, uh, in your opinion, was any of it relevant? Of course it was relevant. That's why we have the Article 11 hearings okay. and to was make that, a determination. And I think we've heard today that some of that was heard for the first time in the habeas uh, hearings that were held subsequent to the trial court, correct? The new science? Yeah, some, some, of, some of the things were, that were not available at the time of Mr. Robertson's initial defense. Is that correct? That's my understanding of uh, why um, y'all passed Article 11.73, where we could hold a hearing to address those issues. Okay, so, so and that's what I'm asking. So you're saying, obviously, of course they're, of course they're relevant. Were, were any of those things that were raised in those hearings, in the habeas hearings, were any of those things not available at the time of Mr. Robertson's initial trial? I understand that one of the experts testified that shaking baby started in 1971. To fully give an appropriate answer, I would have to go back and look. Okay. And you know, we've heard some testimony today that uh, a trial that relied on and to, to whatever extent, whether it was a component of or predominantly relied on shaken baby syndrome, um, certainly wouldn't be litigated in a trial court setting today in 2024 as it would be 20 years ago because of the changes of opinions uh, regarding the applicability of that particular theory. Is that correct? Uh, respectfully, I disagree, given the nature of this offense with the blood force trauma. So the, the defense, so you're saying the defense would look identical today as it did 20 years ago, even with the 
new, new evidence that was first considered by the habeas court? Of course not, because they're, they would bring different experts than the original trial attorneys. So, do you think Mr. Robertson would be convicted today if this trial were tried today with the... Based off the totality of the evidence, the witnesses of his violence towards Nikki, his violent past, yes, I believe based on the evidence that we had before us, he would be convicted. Would, would the prosecution, now I talked about the defense and you said they'd bring different experts. You think the prosecution would look the same today as it did 20 years ago? Yes. Um, it wouldn't take into account his later diagnosis of autism, for instance? He was evaluated. I'm sorry, were you finished? No, no. For instance, would, would the prosecution look different because of a factor like that? Would, you, would it be a different lens over the prosecutorial eye because of that diagnosis? That would be more appropriate for the defense to assert and bring up, I do know that Mr. Robertson, Robertson was evaluated by multiple experts and was not diagnosed with autism in 2003. But we do know that he was subsequently diagnosed with autism. In 2018. Yeah, So, but you're saying that that's an issue for the defense to bring up. You don't think it is the role of a prosecutor to understand uh, a, a diagnosis like autism in evaluating their cases? Sure, we consider all aspects of, of all the information that we have before us. I do not believe though that that would negate someone's inability or ability to murder another individual. Understood, and I didn't say that it would negate it. it yes, sir. Would it change the way that you would view a case or proceed with a case? It, what role would it play, if any? I do not feel comfortable speculating as to that at this moment. Okay, I understand. All right, I'm, I am going to be very respectful of your time. I know you've, you've been waiting around. All, I want to be very clear that you have been, uh, were uh, 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 very amenable to working with our schedule today, and we've had a long day, and so your hard stop is not, uh, is not indicative of you not wanting to have these questions. You could have been presented at any time during the day to go over these. So I want to be very clear about that. And I want to thank you for your time and thank you for, for being with us. And um, going back to Chairman Leach's uh, reference earlier, uh, if we have a subsequent hearing to kind of delve into this more, I think it would be, it might be helpful to glean more information from you at that point. And we can, we can re reach back out to you. Uh, thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate, Thank you all appreciate very your much. time and congratulations to your family. Thank you. May I be excused? Yes, ma'am. Thank you.